Hi everyone, my name is Laura Casper and I'm the owner of Monarch Staffing. We're located in the Philadelphia and Tri-County region. We have been putting people to work for almost 20 years. We've placed close to 10,000 candidates and jobs. And we're excited today to welcome you to how to leverage a recruiter in your job search. And we are just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we have Carly on our line here and she is gonna help us um, monitor the chat. And we're going to ask for audience participation like we have in the past. And we have some Wawa gift cards to give away and stay at the end. Um, we are going to draw a $50 gift, uh, gift card drawing for Amazon. So in this session, we are really going to talk about um, how to leverage a recruiter in your job search. Um, what makes a difference between a good recruiter and a bad recruiter? And some of the tips and tricks that you're going to learn about um, you know how to leverage a recruiter in your job search. So I will, let me just exit here so I can hit this escape thing. And I think we are red, whoops, hold on there. Car just missed it, there we go. Wait, okay, there we go, okay, all right. So we are here, so we're excited to have you and you can hit the next one, Carly. We're gonna go over some information about how to leverage a recruiter in your job search. Do you have the controls there? And if not, I will do it, okay. Yeah, perfect. So, um, you know, it's really important for you to know about what recruiter, and we're gonna talk about, you know, what recruiter might be right for you, um, and some things that maybe you can do and to prep, um, some things about your LinkedIn, and, you know, really what makes a great recruiter, maybe one that's maybe not so good. Talk about some interaction and some resume advice, and, you know, we're really, excited because on this session you're going to hear from the monarch staffing recruiters i have them on with us today and they're going to share with you some insights some real life examples about you know what gives them the thumbs up um, for a candidate and what some of the clients and hiring managers have told them so we're really happy to have them on board with us and we'll have some q a going through uh, this presentation mm -hmm. So let's talk about the difference. So, you know, there are recruiting and staffing agencies and that's somebody like Monarch. There are career counselors, there's headhunters, and then there's something called job coaches. But these um, folks, they're all different and they all add, can add value, but they all are a little bit different. And I wanna just see, kind of just pull the audience here and see, you know, what they're thinking about in the chat. If you wanna just write in real quick, we'll give away a gift card to Wawa here about what you think the difference is between a recruiter, a career counselor, you know, a headhunter, and then somebody called a job coach because they are all different. And sometimes the waters get a little muddy and people kind of get confused when they're speaking to individuals in those different careers. Does anybody want to share some information and see what they share about what is what might be the difference between those categories of people that are trying to help them get to their next step? Anything in their car? If not, not yet. Share. Okay. Someone said a recruiter will match you to a job they have. A career counselor will help you find your career. Yep. Um, a job coach tells you how to position yourself. Right. A headhunter is someone looking specifically for the company. Mm -hmm. Someone said recruiters are free. Um, yeah, definitely. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Whoever had the first answer, Carly, if you want to write down their name, they'll okay. get a uh, Wawa gift card. And that's exactly right. So, you know, recruiters get their jobs from the employers. So the recruiters get paid when they put somebody to work and the candidate does not pay a fee to work with a recruiter or a staffing agency for a placement. And that's really important. So make sure that you, the job seeker, you're not paying a fee when you work with an agency to help you find a job if they're a recruitment or staffing agency. That fee comes from the employer. The career counselor folks, on the other hand, they might be specialty folks that maybe you seek out, sometimes even through CareerLink. You might even find there some career counselors and job coaches that they might help you. There's an organization that we work very closely with um, through Delaware County Community College that is um, you know, putting people back to work. And that organization you know, helps people, you know, maybe through more of a career counseling rather than you know through a job placement. So we do have um, those kinds of folks. And then headhunters on the other end, they're usually, sometimes this can go both ways. Sometimes they're actually paid from the job seeker 
And sometimes they are paid um, from the employer that's looking for somebody. So a headhunter is usually a higher level type of a placement, usually a management executive level uh, person might seek out a headhunter to get them to their next step. Um, but sometimes there are fees involved with that and that you have to watch. And then on the job coach side of it, you know, there are job coaches out there. They might give you some career advice, coach you on your job, um, you know, but they are usually paid services. So we're going to really talk about today the recruitment side of things and what Monarch's about in recruitment and staffing agencies and how you can leverage those resources to help you land a job and move forward. So before you contact a recruiter, I really want you to, you know, kind of do a little bit of soul searching. I think it's really important. I mean, we're in the middle of this pandemic. I mean, people are, you know, repurposing their life, their work, what they want to do. So it's important for you to do the same as a job seeker. You know, what, where do you want to be, you know, in the next couple of years? What are your short-term and long-term goals? You know, what are your strengths and weaknesses? Are you pivoting your career? Are you coming out of retail and maybe now doing something a little bit different? Are you maybe coming out of the medical field and don't want to be in that anymore and doing something different? So kind of know yourself, write down some bullet points about your strengths, some of the things that maybe you want to improve upon, because the more that you can prepare and have this written down in your portfolio, it's going to be really easy for you to articulate what it is that you want when you contact a recruiter like Monarch Staffing so that we can help you find a placement. So do your homework. I mean, here it is, you know, not one agency fits all, not one size fits all. You know, Monarch does placements for administrative, office support, customer service, sales, marketing, a little bit of accounting and IT. But if you're an engineering person and you're coming to Monarch to find a job, I might not be able to help you with that. Or if you're a technical person, or if you're maybe coming out of the medical field, you could do a lot of research these days and find out if there are certain idiosyncrasies and certain job specialties that certain recruitment groups do and they're the ones that you want to leverage because they're going to get you faster to the finish line you know we get paid and recruiters get paid when we put people to work we want to find people jobs so it's really important that you know you kind of come to us and be prepared and have your information ready so the more home the more research you do a little bit of prep work that's going to help us be able to market you quicker and get you out for a placement I want to talk about LinkedIn for a minute because this is really important. And I think a lot of job seekers these days, um, myself included, you know, I was falling short a little bit on this until I got hit up by Lynn Williams from Career Concepts and said, fix your profile. So I did. This is my old one. I forgot to put the new one up there. But, you know, here's the thing. The top of that section in your profile, you got to consider that, those of you that were on the um, How to Write a Resume or other boot camp, you know, that's prime real estate. And I want you to put your skills and qualifications up in front and center. And I want to make it real searchable words. You only have a very limited time and recruiters will look there. So when we go in and we're searching on LinkedIn, Nick is going to talk to you a little bit about that coming up, is that we look for key words. So, you know, if you're out of a job or you're in transition, try to get all your keywords up there first. And if you have room at the end, maybe you can write that information, but I'd rather see that you are a QuickBooks pro, that you're an executive assistant, that you are an accounting expert, um, that you know accounts payable and receivable. Maybe you're a medical coder. We would rather see your really strong skill set at the top than the words in transition because none of us are searching no recruiter, no employment um, agency, not anybody on the employer side or a company side is recruiting and looking for words in transition, open the job opportunities. They're not searchable words. So if you don't take away anything from today's session, remember to make those words search searchable. It's really important. Okay, okay. so um, here's the other piece. So besides the top part being really great and wonderful, make sure things are accurate. So do your dates match up on your resume? Recruiters, us included, we get your resume, we look at your profile, we're looking at LinkedIn. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you might wanna create one. I mean, it is the sign of the times. That's where people are looking um, for candidates. 99% of all recruiters go to LinkedIn first. So you know, make sure things match up, make sure it's a professional picture. You don't wanna have the selfie or the picture on the beach. 
Um, and your skills are really important. Um, skills and qualifications, and nowadays, um, endorsement. I don't know if you've seen that at the bottom, but if you are an executive assistant or if you're a human resource professional and you have expertise in talent management or talent development or organizational development, you wanna get those endorsements and recommendations. It's really hard in today's world to get references. People are just busy. So if you can get references and again, make the employment hiring manager's job easier, make the recruiter's job easier, and put recommendations on LinkedIn, we consider those references, that might be good enough for an employer to take a look at and maybe speak to your qualifications and your set aside and what it is maybe that you've done differently from your peers. And if you happen to have any reference letters, which I think you know, a lot of people have been downsized during this economic downturn um, with the pandemic that we're facing. So if you were lucky enough to get a, a letter from your employer that said that, you know, why you were let go because of the downsizing and speaks to your skills and qualifications, maybe you can upload that somehow as an attachment to your LinkedIn. Maybe you can ask that person to write you a recommendation or just pick out a piece of it and say, look, can you, this is what you wrote in your letter. Can you just cut and paste it real quick and put it there for a recommendation? So try to build up your recommendations when you're in job seeking mode, really important. All right, I wanna talk about the keywords real quick and we're just gonna jump back there. So this list has about five keywords that probably shouldn't be keywords. If anybody can guess those five keywords, I want you to enter them in the chat and we'll give away another Wawa gift card. So. Tried to put some words in there that maybe are really great and wonderful and some that are just kind of cliche and we don't really want to see those cliche words in the top section. It's just as if you were redoing the top of your resume um, is how you kind of want to look at the top of your LinkedIn profile. All right, so somebody did get it. They have sense of humor, team player, track record, and dependable, but some other people did put Sarbanes-Oxley, bilingual, payroll, SAP. Um, okay. Now. So these are the ones. So whoever wrote the first one, Carly, if you want to get their name, yep. we'll get their address. So the things that maybe you might want to leave out are some of the more cliche words. We have them highlighted here, but other words are going to add value. So think about the value that you're going to bring to the table. Employers are eventually going to be hiring. We've already saw an uptake probably in the past two weeks here at Monarch Staffing. We're starting to get requests for people to come back to work, which is a really great thing. And I'm really excited about that. But you don't want to have your profile on LinkedIn kind of be full of cliche words. You want to have your set aside and things that are really going to move you forward and that are going to be searchable. So we're gonna hear from Nick. Um, Nick is our regional staffing manager and we'll bring him on. And we'd like to talk to Nick about, we're talking about LinkedIn and Nick is one of our lead sourcers on LinkedIn. And Nick, you know, can you share with us maybe a little bit about how you go to source for people in LinkedIn? And then maybe talk about, you know, some key things that you look for in a LinkedIn profile to help you make a connection with a job seeker that can help your clients and help you fill a position. Nick? Sure. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm unmuted. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. And, and to go back to, uh, I think it was Daniel Singer who wrote in the comments that having a LinkedIn profile uh, in this day and age is absolutely necessary. Uh, if, I go to a, if I go to someone's LinkedIn and they have one connection or 10 connections and there's no picture and, you know, they have one job listed with no dates, it's 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 not a good sign. I'm probably not going to reach out because I'm, I'm assuming that they're probably not looking for a message from LinkedIn or maybe it's an old email address or an old profile. So it's, uh, it's really important to keep it current. Um, and as mentioned uh, in the pro tips earlier, having your dates line up, be accurate with your resume as a comparison if I'm sourcing online and I see someone's profile and then they have their the resume posted, which isn't always necessary. But if those dates don't line up or if there's different job titles, different companies and, and everything isn't matching up, that's also a red flag. 
So we, we also um, use the, the search section in LinkedIn. And if you go, uh, if you're familiar with it, you can search people up top. And there's a connections drop down, a locations drop down, and a current companies drop down. Okay. So when we're when I'm looking on there, number one, I want to see if I have a first or second, or a second or third connection with someone. If it's if it's a second connection with someone, I might be looking for an introduction to uh, see if I can uh, speak with them directly. Uh, and locations, and then of course current companies, making sure that you have your current company listed correctly. Um, Sometimes you, when you put in a, a company name, it'll auto-generate to what company you have. And that's important that if your company is already listed or your former company is already listed on LinkedIn, that you're using the proper uh, selection of that, of that company name. And then as far as it looking through and uh, again, back to the pro tips that Lara had mentioned before, is that when you're looking at a uh, someone's LinkedIn profile that it's it's complete and, w and when I say complete it means that I'm looking for you know someone who's put the time in to creating their profile whether it's making sure that they have a picture uh, that they you know, do have some endorsements or some recommendations that they've listed their skills that they have all their jobs listed with the correct dates now if you want to go with the rule to not go back too many years that's fine too but at least what you have listed make sure that it's accurate um, and other than that I wouldn't put too much under each position again uh, not too much to read but at least some bullet points to highlight what you did in, uh, in each job there mm -hmm. that's great I think I saw did I see a question pop up Carly yeah definitely I was going to ask if anybody had some LinkedIn questions and maybe they want to shoot over to Nick we can certainly have a little conversation we don't always have an opportunity to have our recruiters with us and to answer some of those questions so if anybody has a questions particularly about recruiters and sourcing on LinkedIn um, we can take them now in the chat and uh, Nick can give us some updates and some oh, I see uh, yeah you know, Dan Dan Singer you got it all right so I have, go ahead Carly yeah, so he just said um, regarding keywords and where they should be put on LinkedIn, if it should be in the open to work section or the about section of your profile. So the keywords and actually what, what Monarch's been doing, and I think, Laura, I forget who gave us this tip, so I, for, so I forget, but we actually, in your job title, mm -hmm. um, so if you go to my page or Laura's page, for example, either one, uh, it'll have our name. And then underneath that, where you would typically put your job title, one place you can actually put in there is some of those, yep. some of those words. Yeah, at some the of top. Those keywords are in there. Mm -hmm. um, so while I, I kept my title in there, I also put helping employees find top talent, staffing agency, and so forth. So these are things that, that Laura also has listed. So yep. when people are searching for uh, on LinkedIn, they're not always just searching keywords, but if you're searching job title, it's just another way to have your right. – um, Right. Yep. If, you're, yep. Up. Yep. if you're bilingual, if you're a benefits representative, if you're an executive assistant, if you're, you know, an accounting expert, an accounting specialist, an ADP payroll processor, definitely want to have it at the top. Um, and it's okay, definitely to list it again at the bottom. Um, and then when you're searching for jobs, make sure that, you know, we'll get to that a little bit later, but those words are added in there too. <clears throat> yep. And also, if you are if you are committed to being active on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. the one thing you want to do is, in fact, be active. So, yeah. whether it's liking or commenting, because the more active you are, the more that you're going to show up in people's uh, feed. Right. Uh, so it's a, so Very it's good. important that you know that you are reading and that you're using it that way. That's one thing people don't realize is that the more that you're active, the more that you're posting, that um, you will, in fact come up more often get noticed. people's feeds. So. Right, yeah. you'll get noticed. If you're looking for an executive assistant job, you might want to share an article and about an executive assistant, or you might comment on people that are sharing articles. So yeah, I think that's a great tip, Nick, about being active on LinkedIn and you know posting things and commenting, and it's a way to get noticed by hiring managers and recruiters as well. Really good tips. Yep, thank you. Is there any other questions there? Yeah, somebody had asked, um, what does sourcing mean? Okay. Or to source? Um, source? Uh, 
I mean, sourcing is just means that uh, we're it's just a word we use to search for candidates. So uh, sourcing tools, for example, on Indeed or LinkedIn, there are tools that recruiters use that are sometimes behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just allows us to be able to, uh, I guess, search would be another word you could use, but to, to source is to look for resumes specifically uh, for a certain position. Yep. Um, and you know, using those, those skills and those keywords as uh, ways that we can search for it. That makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, someone also asked if, well, are we using the premium version? I know we use the premium version. Um, I don't know if job seekers have to use the premium. No, I don't think so. Mm -mm. Save your money. Yeah, yeah there's uh, using the, the advanced search, which is nice. I mean, you can use that feature. I think the only thing you're limited to is in mails. Yes. Um, but yeah, we've, uh, I've used both, both on the recruiting side. Um, and you know, there is a recruiter LinkedIn version as well, but, uh, I mean, you can really get a lot done with the free version. Yep. Good and then there's it. another about using the open for work option that LinkedIn offers, um, yes. for candidates that are looking for work. You can like flip that looking for work over. Yep. And I know yeah, so there's, that's on our side. There's some features that, again, on, on the premium and the recruiter side that aren't uh, public. So mm -hmm. if you're using it to recruit and you have a premium version or a, a recruiter LinkedIn version, uh, someone who, for example, if they're at their current company, they don't want their employer to see that they're looking. There are some things on the back end that you can do that only recruiter or some with that, that version would be able to know that you're open the to work. The settings, right, under the privacy yeah. settings. And I think if you're mm -hmm. open to work, you should flip that switch because that would save you the time. You don't have to waste the space in the top of your profile. Put the keywords in. Yep. Are there any others there, Carr? Um, when you are pivoting, should you or could you delete, keep off a keyword? for that industry, example, ultrasound technologist to just tech. Yeah. So I guess if you're changing, if you Definitely. want to change industries, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank I think you. that'd be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, I mean, tech, that, that, that example, you might bring up a whole lot of different types of tech. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think that, um, I think whatever you're interested in, uh, you know, however you word that, I just don't know that, that that example, I, I wouldn't. I'm not sure what that would bring up. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I do it think that whether it's, it's tech side, right? Maybe it's like if it's medical technician instead of to be more specific, maybe be more general, mm -hmm. um, whatever it might be. Okay. All right, we got them all, Car. Yeah, there is one more about having that um, open to work. Yeah. if it would be a turnoff for recruiters, but I would think that would be good for recruiters because then you would know that they're looking for work. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a positive, yep. Yeah, I think it's, that's it's positive. It's positive. All right, that's okay, all. Good. Thank you, thanks everyone who participated. So we're gonna talk now about, you know, what makes it thumb up, you know, when you talk to a recruiter with a really great recruiter and what is maybe not so good. So we're gonna talk about yeah, they, not so much. So here's the thing. When you contact a recruiter, there's a lot of different recruiters, a lot of staffing agencies out there. Some recruiters might not be listening when you're talking. If they don't show enthusiasm, they're not excited about hearing from you, they're not asking behavioral or follow-up questions, they seem real rushed, especially at the first call, you know, or they're misrepresenting the job. You know, here's the thing. When we get attempt to hire a job at Monarch, we're going to tell you it's attempt to hire a job. If we only have a two-week project, we're going to tell you it's a two-week project, but I can tell you sometimes those two-week projects turn into three-month jobs, turn into higher jobs. So don't limit yourself when you're looking for a position. Sometimes be open to contract work because sometimes it's not what you're doing, it's who you're exposed to that can help you along the way and build your resume and make connections. I've seen many two-week jobs turn into a lot longer. So, you know, think about, you know, when you're talking to a recruiter and, you know, are they listening? Are they asking the right questions? You know, that's really important. And on the good side, you know, a good recruiter is really going to take the time to listen to you. 
Um, a good recruiter is going to take the time to really kind of get to know you. Okay, Carl, you can flip. Um, a good recruiter is really going to ask you about your pet peeves and, you know, what's important to you and your career goals and your accomplishments. It's okay and you should, as a job seeker, write these questions down. Write your answers to these questions down. Know your skill set. Um, you know, and a good recruiter is going to follow up and it's good to keep in touch with your recruiter and ask them, you know, when should I follow up? When's the next time? When is a good um, time to get in touch with you? But here's the thing. We're filling positions now. We're starting to get busier. Even a good recruiter might not have all the time to be able to kind of give you career counseling advice. We're typically not career counselors. Um, so we might not be able to listen to all of that. But, you know, our goal is to really help you find a job. And that that's how we get paid when we place people. So we want to know your strengths, your weaknesses, why you left your last job. Um, be upfront with us and let us know um, so we can make the best placement for you. That's what it's about. So I'm going to hear from Andy. So Andy's our senior recruiter and I'm going to have Andy talk about some of the favorite questions that she likes to ask to get to know someone. And if I were you, I would write down some of these questions and then your answers to some of these questions because they really do give the recruiter some insight into you and your personality and how we can best place you in a position. So Andy, I'll turn it over. So share with us some of your favorite questions to ask and maybe some of the answers that maybe you have gotten later on that have um, really helped you and maybe some ones that maybe haven't. All right, Perfect. thanks Andy. Sure. Oh, thank thanks. you, Laura. Thank yep. you, thanks. Can everyone hear me okay? We're good, you can hear me? Yep. Okay, um, so thank you, thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited to be able to share some of these uh, questions because this is really my favorite part of my job, getting to know you. So some of the things that I typically like to ask are, um, you know, is there something that's on your, not on your resume that you'd like to share with me? Uh, it could be a work accomplishment, some sort of volunteer work, um, it would really help me better to know those types of things. Oftentimes people don't put them on their resume, things that they think maybe aren't relevant to um, the job that they might be seeking. But if it's relevant to you in some form or another, it's, it's relevant. Uh, you matter, you know, and um, the more that I know about those things, the easier it's going to be for me to place you and sort of you know, uh, find that unique thing about you that maybe that employer is looking for and you just don't know it. Um, you know, if, I have some notes here, sorry. Um, you know, if, if that part of you, if you don't let that part shine, no one's ever going to know that it exists. So make sure that you tell me those things. And I love the answers I get because for everyone it's different. Um, you know, each person has their own story to tell and for me, listening to that and understanding where you've come from is, is really important. Another thing I like to ask is if you are an early bird or a night owl. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of a silly question maybe to the ear, but really where I'm going with that is I need to know what hours work best for you. Uh, this also pertains to interviewing. I want you to interview at your best part of the day, right? I don't want you to interview if you're going to be tired or you know, some people sort of check out after three o'clock, including myself. It's hard for me to focus. It's easier for me to interview in the morning. Um, so I, I really like to know that about you as well. Uh, another thing that I like to do is ask a lot of behavioral questions. You know, I want you to tell me about the personality traits that really you can attribute your own success to. Uh, I might ask you some things like describe a time when you received constructive feedback. How did that make you feel? You know, tell me about a time when you had to overcome conflict at work. And the reason I like to ask those questions is because I know that the clients are asking them too. Mm -hmm. A lot of our clients are really going in that direction with the behavioral type of questions. And the reason that they're doing it is because you could look great on paper, you know, everything might check out, but if there's a personality clash, that's, that's not going to work. We wanna make sure that we're finding you the right types of positions with those uh, personality, um, you know, uh, cohesiveness as well. And then let's see here. Um, this is one of my favorite, favorite questions to ask. I always ask if there's something that you haven't done that you would like to do. It's a great way to 
answer a weakness question that a client might ask on an interview. So if they say, what's your greatest weakness? Supposing you've had um, an interest in public speaking, but you just haven't had the chance to do it yet. You can say something like, you know, I've really been wanting to explore public speaking and I haven't had that opportunity to do it just yet. Currently, this is a weakness of mine, but a goal is to make that into a strength. So it's sort of a nice way to turn around that, that difficult question, but also it allows them to see some of the, um, sorry, my son just walked in. It's part of the virtual world here these days. Uh, but it really allows them to, you know, see where your goals lie and okay, all right, this person wants to learn. They want to grow with us and this is how we can help them do it. Um, basically my favorite answers for a lot of these questions all stem from a high level of transparency. It is literally my job to find that right fit for you, get you through the door for an interview and my write-ups about you. This is why I ask all these questions because again, you may look great on paper. Maybe you don't look so great on paper, but it's my job to get you through the door for that. So if I, the more I know about you, the more I can say in that write up to the client and say, this is why you should interview this person. Mm -hmm. You know, in addition to that, we provide you with all kinds of resources in terms of different sample interview questions. We want, we want to prep you before the interviews as well. Um, but really knowing from you in advance, the things that you really want to do. I also want to know the things you don't want to do. I want to know if you've had a bad experience in a certain industry or something like that. So I don't make the mistake of placing you in a similar role going forward. That being said, the, you know, let the positive side of those positions also come out because negative, um, you know, negative uh, answers get a negative reaction. So if somebody's asking you about a former position that you really didn't like, don't focus on that part of it. Focus on the things that you did like about it and say, I didn't have the opportunity to do X, Y, Z. That's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the more we know, the more we can find that right fit for you. So um, that's truly my favorite part of this job. And I'll hand it on back to you. If we have any questions, I'm not sure if I saw any. Yeah, that's great. Is there any questions? Anybody want to ask Andy about any questions or anything, you know, stemming from, you know, the things that she might ask or some questions? I mean, Sometimes when people interview, they're like hindsight's 2020, like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have said this or I shouldn't have said that. And, you know, we understand mistakes and hiccups happen. But is there anybody have any questions for Andy about maybe some of the things that she's heard um, that they want to just kind of chime in? And if not, that's okay. Hi, too. Dan. Hi, Dan. Hi, Lauren. I just saw your, <laughs> your message. <laughs> Two of our stellar candidates. That's great. Okay. Some questions there. Go ahead. Yes, yeah, so there is one. Um more so about timing and follow-up. So what's good timing for recruiters between follow-ups? Should someone be following up every couple weeks, every month, or does it depend on what's happening? Sure, so uh, I really approach it. I kind of figure out with the, with the candidate what they prefer. I don't wanna bother you, you know? It's not something that I want to um, be checking in with you every two days. That's not, that's not my way. Um, I like to kind of check in maybe once a week, uh, once every two weeks, maybe if that's what we have agreed upon, you know, recruiter to candidate. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do keep you posted, especially if there's maybe a client that you've interviewed with and they're taking a bit of time to respond. It happens from time to time. You know, I'll keep you warm. I'll find out where you are in your interview process elsewhere. I want to know those things too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really yeah. important that we do that. That's part of our, our position to check in with you. Um, and then this is more specific to interviewing in general, but what if you haven't had a certain experience that is asked about during the interview? Then be, uh, go ahead, Andy. Mm -hmm. Sure. So if you haven't had an, an experience that is asked about during the interview, supposing they say something to you like, have you had experience in Salesforce, let's say, um, that might be one of those things that and perhaps that's not something that we've known in advance that is required for the position. Usually we know everything that they want, but that might be a way that a client sort of delves in and asks you just to maybe if they haven't seen it on your resume, they want to see your response to it. That's mm -hmm. a great question. It's one of those things that um, I always kind of tackle as the weakness section. I say, you know, I haven't had the opportunity to really delve into Salesforce. Maybe I've seen it here and there. That's something I really want to learn. Any resource that I can 
utilize in order to uh, pick that up and, and really get good at that is definitely important to me. You know, you want to make sure that whatever they're asking you is something that you're, <laughs> you right. want to learn and you're, you want to be exposed to it. If you haven't had that exposure, it is what it is. I mean, but you know, definitely don't lie. Yeah. Um, but turn sure. that into a positive for sure. And it's good too. I think I'm going to chime in here, Andy, for a minute. I think it's good if you have other similar skill sets with other similar softwares, other CRM tools that you maybe relate to those other CRM tools. If it's not Salesforce, maybe it was something else that you worked in. Or if you were doing UltiPro and they're using ADP, you know, you can say, well, I haven't worked in UltiPro, but I've worked in ADP and here's my, here's what I've done there. So you can kind of pivot that but I love your idea and your answer about, you know, it's something that I really want to learn about. But, you know, you have that job description. So typically, you know, you're going to look at that. And if there's words on that job description that you don't know, then you want to research those words ahead of time before you go in to the interview and do your homework. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then, there's, go ahead. Those, those uh, transferable skills are really where you're going to see, you know, just like Laura said, I mean, you want to make it as relatable as possible. So absolutely use those to your advantage on those interviews. Yeah. And then there's and one more listed on your resume. <laughs> there's one more question that's more of like a behind the scenes, I guess, for us type of question. And that's if we send more than one candidate out for a position, which is more of like a staffing agency as a whole kind of question, I think. Yeah, depend, it depends on who's available at that time. So sometimes, depending on the job, there might be one, only one candidate that we send, and that would be it. But other times, maybe there's two candidates that we might send, or sometimes three, and it depends how many people uh, the employer's hiring. You know, sometimes we have big projects, and there's five, they need five to ten people. In that case, we might send 20 candidates over. So it really just depends on who's available. But typically the max that we would send for any one position are three good resumes, three good candidates typically for every position that we get in if we have the opportunity to. And sometimes it's only one. Mm -hmm. Only takes one person to fill the job, the right one. So yeah. it's only one. Mm -hmm. And then last question. Um, is what if you have a successful initial meeting with a recruiter, but then you don't hear back from them? So sometimes you might not hear back because we might not have the right job for you at that time. Maybe you come in and you're an ADP payroll processor and we just don't have an ADP payroll processor job. I would shoot the recruiter maybe a quick email, you know, once a month and just check in and look at the open jobs. I mean, if we have a position that we have this, you have the skill set for, we're going to reach out and get a hold of you and contact you for it. And it's certainly okay for you to circle back, even if it's like once a month or every three to four weeks to check in you know and what's really helpful is that as a job seeker if you can when you send your emails and your quick check-ins to the recruiters if you can just really quick put your phone number at the bottom of your signature that's really super helpful because sometimes we're so busy, we're filling this job, we're filling that job, and then we get a quick email that says, hey, you know what, I'm back available now, or I just got laid off from my other job, and we want to give you a call real quick. So instead of us having to close down the email, look in our system, search for the thing, if you have your phone number there real quick, Andy, Nick, our recruiters, we can get a hold of you really, really quickly. So it's super helpful to put your phone number right underneath your signature at all times when you're contacting, when you're going back and forth to a recruiter. Okay. Great. All right. So let's talk about, you know, being honest and being upfront about your skills and qualifications and limitations and your strengths and weaknesses. Here's the thing, you know, recruiters, hiring managers, we're all trained on how to interview, but you know, we want to know from you, we want to know the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like Andy said, if there's some weaknesses or there's even a personal situation, it's okay. If you physically can't get to a job by nine o'clock, then you physically can't get there. If you are, were in between jobs and you were taking care of your folks or doing some elder care work um, and caring for somebody that wasn't well. We want to explain those gaps in your resume. So be honest with us and let us help you 
articulate in your resume and let us help you articulate in your interview um, th to put your best foot forward. We can give you some tips on that and how to um, put your best foot forward to the candidate, to the client, so that you're coming up in the right light, that we can shine the light and you can get the position. So please be honest with us and let us know. We had a situation, we placed somebody on a job. It was in actually an HR department for one of our clients and she did a fabulous job. It was just a one month assignment. They wound up extending her to three months kept her for almost a year and then they were going to hire her they went to um, hire her they do a background check for their education we as the staffing agency were not responsible for doing that we will do a background check they asked us to do a criminal background check and a drug check so we did that and every job will have different qualifications so you have to be ready for those as well they didn't ask us for an education background but while they were evaluating this woman, they really liked her and they asked her to complete their in-house application along with a verification for her degree. And when they went to verify the degree, now the degree was even on the resume. It came to us, it said degree on the resume. Not only did she not have the degree, she never even attended the college. And that day at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, she got walked out. She was there for almost a year and lost a great opportunity. They didn't even require a degree for the job and she lost the opportunity. So please be honest on your resume, um, be articulate and you know, let us know those things because it was a really hard lesson. It was a $60,000 a year job and this person lost out. So really, really important. Even though we might not check it, your, employee, your other employer might. So our goal is to really learn about your experience, like Andy said, really kind of help us to kind of help you leverage our, um, you know, our relationships with the um, hiring managers. Because here's the thing, when you go to work with a staffing agency and what our strength is, is that we have relationships with hiring managers and recruiters around various companies. So when you send us a resume and when we prep you and we send your resume, that is being looked at directly by a hiring manager and a recruiter. When you send your resume, it's going into an applicant tracking system. And that's why sometimes when you leverage your opportunities with a staffing agency, we're able to get you seen a lot quicker than sometimes you might not be able to get seen on your own. So it's really, really important for you to teach us and learn. We want to learn from you what's important, but we really want to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. And make sure you contact your references too, because our employers and us, we're going to be doing that as well. And why you left your last job, that's certainly um, acceptable in today's world to even put that on your resume as to maybe why you left your last job. So that's important too. Yep, we're going to hear from Ariel. Ariel's our senior recruiter, and you know she does a lot of interviewing for us, great placements, which does some great super successes. And you know we want to hear from Ariel about some of the red flags that might come up in a resume review or maybe even an interview that could maybe hesitate on her end or even the candidate, the hiring manager side or the recruiter side that we're working with in even bringing in that candidate. And then we're going to ask Arielle to share some of her best advices that she can give some of the job hoppers that we've seen out there. So Arielle, are you on with us? I am. Hi. Hi, Hi everybody. Hi, Nancy. Nice. I met you yesterday. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Again. Um, nice to so, have you here. So can you share with us some of the red flags that you've seen in maybe resumes or interviews that have, you know, the clients have said to you or that you've seen yourself that maybe might hesitate on bringing in a candidate? Sure. Yeah. So I'll run through them kind of quickly. And if there's any specific questions about them in further detail, put them in the chat and I can go back to that. Perfect. Uh, so some of the things that I see most often as almost like a whoop, <laughs> like our, our radar kind of goes off a little bit as recruiters um, is the first one is date discrepancies. Mm -hmm. So um, sometimes these can be just honest mistakes. It might be that your experience is a little bit further out um, in the past and you just can't remember if it was 2001 or you know what month it was but it's really important um, for those to be correct um, and for those to be cohesive across platforms where you're posted so if your LinkedIn profile I think Nick touched on this earlier if your LinkedIn profile doesn't match your um, your resume that's something that that we're trained to notice um, and with that as well, 
is experience. So if your experience is vastly different from platform to platform, um, or if you're not able to articulate your experience. So if you say that you processed payroll, for example, through ADP, and I ask you how you did that, how many employees, um, what functions were you responsible for in terms of taxation, and you don't know what I'm talking about, um, that's going to be that's going to be a red flag for me. Um, that maybe you haven't been entirely honest about what is on um, what you might have put on your resume. You might have embellished a little bit, which honestly isn't isn't necessary. There's there's a lid for every pot. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, red flag for us is unexplained gaps. So gaps on a resume certainly happen. Um, someone could be sick, you could be caring for a family member, you could take some time off to raise a family, um, you could have gone back to school, whatever the reason is, um, gaps certainly happen on any person's resume. They just need to be addressed. Um, they could be addressed in a couple of different ways. So you could highlight it on your resume, um, just a line in between that large gap. So if you say from this date to this date, I volunteered, or from this, this year to this year, stay at home parent, whatever it is, you can address it that way. Um, you can put it in a cover letter. Um, you could also talk about it during the interview. Um, when, when someone asks you at, at the point during the interview where you would, the recruiter would say, so tell me about your experience, let's walk through your experience, your work history. Um, you could say just on the front, I want to let you know that there is a gap in my resume. I'll talk about it, but point it out um, mm -hmm. so that they know that there's nothing to hide there, right? Um, another red flag that we see pretty often is large jumps in terms of level in career. Um, so if you, for example, you were an executive at some point and now you want to be a file clerk, that's totally fine. Totally up to you. Maybe you retired. Maybe you burnt out. Whatever it is, is totally fine. Um, but again, those need to be to be explained in some way, and that's best done in the interview on the front for mm -hmm. sure. Um, I think this might what my, is in the chat might go into my to my next point mm -hmm. about those um, those date discrepancies. If you do have a large date discrepancy. Another way to um, overcome that obstacle is a functional resume. So um, there are a couple of different kinds of resumes, but most often you'll see a chronological resume where it goes from your most recent uh, position on back to um, your, your furthest out position within the scope of 10 years because that remains relevant. Um, anything beyond 10 years experience is no longer relevant. Um, I'm even at an age where I can start to date myself um, with experience, uh, but mostly not necessarily because of age discrimination. We would hope that that wouldn't be a problem, mostly because it's just not relevant any longer. Um, but the second type and the way that you can overcome um, those gaps is a functional resume. So a functional resume is, um, is arranged in, in a way where you highlight your skills. So you can break it down into a bullet of human resources, administrative, and then you say under those headers, your experience in each one of those um, functions of your job. So, or even in your, in your career, really. So if you have had HR experience, if you did hiring, and firing, training, onboarding, put that under an HR header. Um, if you had sales experience, write out your metrics under that header. And then itty bitty <laughs> at the bottom is where you would list out your dates, the company, the company uh, location yep, and right. your title. And that would just be a quick little, you know, list of the positions within the last 10 years um, that you, that you've had there. Um, and it almost, it almost hides it a little bit, or it highlights, it hides it for sure, but it highlights your experience, your achievements, the things you want an employer to see first. Yep. Um, any questions about any of that before I continue on? Good, good, good. Okay. Um, so something that 
can be, there's two things in the interview itself that, that I do notice as um, kind of uh, maybe not so great. Um, so being able to speak to how you did something, and this goes back to being able to articulate your experience. So we can read, right? Um, we can read your, your resume, but because we can, we want to know deeper. We want you to dive deeper in the interview. I want you to say, this is, this is bullet A, but this is how I did it. So if you achieved some really great sales metrics, tell me what your sales strategy was. Um, if you had some really great team achievements as a manager, tell me how you motivated your staff. Um, so not just kind of reiterating what I can read on your resume, elaborating on that, telling us the hows. Um, and then something that is a fine line here um, is being a little too chatty or oversharing. So oversharing as it relates certainly to negativity, and Andy talked about this a little bit. So not every experience we have on this earth as humans is going to be positive, and that we know that as recruiters, um, we know that if there, we know we know the words, the kind of key words as you know, if there was a change in management, we know that maybe you just didn't get along. There are certain things that we can infer um, that you don't necessarily have to tell us. You want to remain positive. You want to remain hopeful. That's something, again, that we see. We see people who are in transition, and we are certainly compassionate to that. We're empathetic. A lot of us came to Monarch ourselves in transition. Yeah. Um, but we, we are here to help and we want to keep that that hope and that positive outlook towards your job search and you want to convey that um in your interview Definitely. Um, so kind of to just wrap it up i i always think about this so if you go to a store and you're comparing dishwashers right um the salesperson in order to for you to pick one they want you to pick one they're going to tell you dishwasher a does this dishwasher b does this they're going to sell you the benefits of each one of those. They all do the same thing, right? Um, but one might do this one great thing that, that really sells you on it. So make sure that when you're selling yourself in an interview, everything that you are saying adds value in some way um, and shows a recruiter that you are better than dishwasher B because of this one, this one or two or three different qualities that you have. Um, you want to sell the benefits of yourself as an employee. Great. Any other questions? Um, maybe any job hopper questions? Mm -hmm. You want to ask Ariel about any other red flags in the chat there? Just make sure we get them all. We might go a little bit over here because we have our recruiters on, but I think it's well worth hearing from them. And we have Jen coming up next. And I just want to make sure that we get all your questions answered, all of you that are on the program today. Any questions in the chat there, Carly? Ariel, you see, let's see. Uh, if you have a successful meeting, I don't know if that was, I think we covered that one. Um, whoever posted that, if we didn't cover it, just repost it. Um, so the overqualified, underqualified statement, um, that's a challenging one, but I would try to sell where you are in your career. So if you are overqualified and you're looking to take a step back, if you, um, everybody's kind of in this, or a lot of people are in this boat, if you experienced a layoff um, and you're coming into, into the job market again, overqualified, sell your benefits as somebody who can hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. um, underqualified, you want to sell it as somebody who's willing to learn, eager to learn, able to learn quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that helps. How would you, so this says, how would you list last employer dates if you are currently on furloughed with no return date? Um, to present or do you list the furlough date? You can do both, to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, if you, I would say if you are seeking an opportunity not to return, um, I would list the furlough date. Mm -hmm. If you are looking for temporary things to fill in, um, you can say to present. It kind of just depends on, um, what your goal is. Yeah. Disabled looking for work as a result, three years unemployed. Um, so 
you it looks like you are asking how to present your gap without adding too much personal information um, on your resume if you have um, any professional development that you can add in there you can certainly list that at the top so I would move your work history down on your resume and add any certifications you've achieved any courses you've taken and you can list those out with dates um, mm -hmm. so it almost looks like you know in this time this is exactly what I was doing and you don't you can you know when you're talking about it in an interview you can say due to personal circumstances um, but this is what I've done to keep myself sharp, to keep myself, um, you know, relevant in, in the job market. Yep. And I think that's it. I hope, I hope that was helpful guys. Yep. Thanks Ariel. That was great. Okay. So, you know, here's the thing. We talked about this on the interview section. You never get a second chance to make a good first impression. And the way you come to us at the agency, that's a perceived perception. And, you know, that's the way you're going to interact with a client or a recruiter. So you want to put your best foot forward always on your voicemail, on your answering machine, um, through an email, how you write an email to a recruiter. If there's a lot of misspellings and things aren't articulate, we might not be the first person that's going to give you a call back for an interview. So really think about, you know, how how you reach out um, and your professionalism counts all the way from our recruiter assistant to the person that might be doing your placement to myself so it's really important that everybody is treated with respect and vice versa you know be prepared and you know follow company procedures you know if we tell you we presented your resume and you know we'll know in two weeks give us those two weeks you don't need to tell us every day did you hear anything did you hear anything because you know we are we're working and we're trying to find you a job and if we don't have a lot of time to spend with you on the phone that's why we want to get you out and we want to fill the positions um, and then just you know yourself be ready to answer and ask questions okay, you have Jen yep so here's the thing about the recruiters you really listen to their advice they know the clients as best um, and sometimes better than you will know a lot of times you might not know who you're interviewing with when you go in cold but a recruiter is going to know um, the tag crowd words is just really a reminder there when we send you the job description you've already were taught drop your resume into tag crowd and see if the key words come up same thing with a job description. Drop the job description in the tag crowd. See what the key words are. Make sure you can articulate those key words in the um, interview um, with the person that the recruiter is sending you on. Um, make sure you have some results oriented. It's not just all tasks. And really be um, mindful that when a recruiter is saying, add this to your resume, put it in there because they've already presented candidates maybe that have been shot down and they know you have the skills. And Ariel mentioned about selling. We're selling our clients on interviewing you. So if you can help us do that, then that's going to make our job easier and we're going to get you seen a lot quicker for an opportunity. So take the uh, recruiter's advice. They know what the client is looking for in the resume, and they even know sometimes the questions that the recruiters are going to be asking you on the other end when you go in for that interview. So there's a quick example. I think it might be on the Next slide there, yeah. So we were filling a position for a client who was looking for an executive assistant. And this per uh, president was a dog person all the way. We sent a couple candidates in and somehow we found out that this, these people mentioned, that. not that that would be a reason not to get a job, but a few of our candidates didn't get jobs. So the next one going in, we said, we do not want you to mention anything that you have two cats and just put your personality out there. You know, your professionalism, all that you've done as an executive assistant and let's get you to land this job. And the person listened to us and they got the job, which was wonderful. So a lot of times we know those insider tips and you can leverage that opportunity to get you to the next step. And it's okay to ask the recruiter, tell me a little bit about the person who's going to be doing the interviewing. Do you know the questions that they're going to ask? What are their pet peeves? They can share with you some insider tips that are going to help you get ahead and land that job. So we're going to hear from Jen next because Jen does a great job for us at Monarch Staffing. She's our bilingual um, recruitment manager and she she does quite a bit of candidate preps when they're getting people ready to go into an interview. And she's going to share with them some of the advice that she gives candidates. And then on the flip side, I want her to share with you some things that when we get back on the phone and we're doing the debrief, 
with their recruiter or the hiring manager that interviewed you, I want her to share some things that these hiring managers and recruiters are sending to her post-interview. So Jen, welcome and love to hear some of your advice sure. on what you're doing to help prep the candidates. Hi everyone, thanks Laura. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. I know we're a little bit over time, so I'm gonna keep this short and concise, but I definitely wanna share things that we have proved that have worked with our candidates. So yep. first and foremost, I would definitely say, be positive, bring your enthusiasm, bring your passion. If you're not passionate about the job that you are interviewing for, why in the heck should that company be excited about hiring you? Mm -hmm. um, so make sure you're bringing your passion to the table. Um, definitely if it's in person and we are seeing some companies asking for folks to interview in person, obviously, um, case by case um, with, uh, with, with every company, but if it is in person, obviously bring several copies of your resume. Um, if it's online, I would also highly, highly encourage our candidates, make sure there's no background noise you have. If you can get a professional background, literally right before um, this webinar I was looking online, there's free Zoom backgrounds. You can make a professional background. Just make sure it's professional. You don't have your cat or your pets running around. Um, Definitely also to know the job description, do your homework online, look them up, find out what their core values are, find out what their mission is. Um, have they been in the news lately? Um, have they had any recent press releases? Bring that up, show them that you're on your A game and you did your research. Mm -hmm. um, don't forget to pause and smile. I always say, who's not nervous in an interview, but if you don't smile and you're looking down, why should they be confident in hiring you? Don't forget to maintain your eye contact as well. It's okay to look down at your notes if you get stuck and you don't know how to answer a question. Hopefully you took some notes down and you can glance down at your notes and hopefully that will prompt you and hopefully get you right back up to speed. Um, also, make sure to provide concrete examples. We hear this constantly from our clients that the candidate, they, they didn't know, how, they, they weren't able to articulate concrete examples. If they're asking you how to work under pressure, explain to them how you did that in your previous jobs, um, specifically. Um, don't forget to take notes as they're talking, nod, show them that you're engaged. Do not obviously wander off, <laughs> stay focused and make sure you're maintaining that eye contact. Um, Make sure as well that you follow up with a thank you. You're taking notes. You ask questions at the end. I always say three, I always encourage candidates, three questions is a good number. You don't want to ask them 10. They may have 50 interviews after your interview. So be cognizant of the client's time as well. Um, also, don't forget to look them up on LinkedIn. I always say bonus points there. I always encourage our candidates, look at who that manager is on LinkedIn. Maybe you identify with someone with a random hobby that that person that's interviewing has. I've always had clients come back to me and say, oh, I didn't know Joe's son was on my sister's baseball team or something. You never know how you, like, Laura, I think a couple people mentioned this in the past um, about how you can connect with that particular um, yep. manager on something random, totally irrelevant to the job. So don't forget to look them up on LinkedIn. Um, also, negatives. I'll jump into the negatives. Things that we've heard from our clients after post-interview, why they did not get the job. So, obviously, being late. I always say late. being on time is late, okay? So, don't be on time. Be early. If it is in person, do a dry run the day before. Visit them so you do not get lost. You don't have any issues. Give yourself plenty of time to get there. If it's virtually, log on 30 minutes before, make sure that Zoom or that team meetings, you're up and ready to go, so they're not waiting on you come the exact time of that interview. Um, also, obviously, another thing that we've heard from clients is not maintaining that eye contact, so don't forget, maintain that eye contact. Don't over talk the client. I know Laura's mentioned this a lot. Don't listen to what they're asking you. If you need some time to respond or you're not sure to respond, take a, take a pause or ask them, can you please rephrase the question, okay? Don't ramble. If you're not sure, just ask them to rephrase the question for you. Um, also, another thing we've heard, we just had this with a client of ours last month. Someone didn't get the job because their dates didn't match up on LinkedIn. Also, grammatical errors. It was actually one of our accounting firm clients. They said there was two grammatical errors on LinkedIn. Have someone else proofread your LinkedIn as well, not just you. Um, and don't forget, again, that make make sure that you're asking those questions at the end we constantly hear that oh the, the interview they didn't ask any questions they're not interested so we're not going to hire them 
Yeah. Um, yep. And then um, I think that's it. That's great. Anybody have any questions for Jen on anything that maybe she could answer for you on any comments or things that you have questions about on the recruiting side? I think we covered a lot. Or anything in there? I think we're good, right, Car? Yeah, no, I don't see any more. Great. All right. Thanks, Jen. That's awesome. So communication is key. Stay in touch with your recruiter. Find out. Ask them, how do you want to be contacted? How should I follow up with you? Enthusiasm, thank you notes. You know, let us help you land the job. So, you know, um, we are going to, Carly has um, everybody's name in a fishbowl there. Um, you know, we want to thank you for your opportunity and spend time with us today um, to go through this and help us leverage, um, you know, your re recruiter to help find a job search. And you can check us out at uh, monarchstaffing.com and look at our jobs at monarchstaffing.com. And we'd love to have an opportunity to help you uh, land your next position. So who is our $50 winner, Carly? And we can wrap things up. We're only a couple minutes over. So I really appreciate everybody with their time today. Who wins? You have to be present to win here. Angela Grimley. Is Angela Grimley on? He's in here. Yeah, I see her in the chat. In the chat. All right, Angela, you win. She's one of our candidates and you win our $50 gift card. We have her address, Carly. Awesome. So, Angela, congratulations. Thank you for um, jumping in on how to leverage a recruiter in your job search. We wish you the best and thank you for attending our boot camp. And um, we'll see. Maybe we'll be back out with these in another couple of months. So thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you recruiters. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Thank Jen. you as well. Nick and everybody uh, on the call there and Ariel really appreciate your comments. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, everyone. All right. Okay. And let me hit pause here. All right. We are good. Great. All right. Carly, so when I get back, I'll send that to Angela. Okay. That's awesome. Sounds good. Stop share. And let me end meeting. All right. Thanks, everyone. Here we go. And